I will first talk with you about stars which have a mass less than eight times the mass of the sun. So everything I'm going to tell you now is only holds for mass below eight times the mass of the sun. So the sun itself is less than eight times the mass of the sun, right? These stars now ignite hydrogen. The hydrogen becomes helium, the thermonuclear reaction. And in the case of our sun, I told you already, it takes about 10 billion years for this hydrogen to burn. There comes a time that most of the hydrogen has been consumed in the thermonuclear reactions, and so most of it now is helium, because the hydrogen burns to helium. So when the hydrogen stops being powerful, the heat source goes down, and so the star shrinks. But when the star shrinks, you convert gravitational potential energy back into kinetic energy, because it's falling into itself, so the center gets hotter. And now the helium says, aha, now the temperature is high enough for helium to go into thermonuclear reactions. And so the helium takes over. And so the furnace starts again. However, the helium fusion produces more energy per second than the hydrogen did per second. And therefore, the furnace becomes stronger than it was before. And so what is the star doing? What is the star? The star gets bigger. So the star grows now. And then there comes a time that the helium, which in the thermonuclear fusion produces carbon, that the helium has been used up. Well, the furnace goes out. What will the star do when the furnace goes out? It will shrink. What will happen with the temperature inside? It will go up. And so now the carbon says, OK, now it's my turn, and carbon starts to ignite. And that then comes at one point to an end for stars that have a mass roughly eight solar masses or lower. And so the carbon then in its last cycle burns to oxygen, and the amount of heat that is produced in each cycle, the amount of heat per second in each cycle becomes larger than the previous one. So the star becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it becomes what we call a giant. When that happens to our sun, which will happen in about 10 billion years, the sun will become 50 to 100 times larger than it is now. So imagine the sun in the sky is now like this, and then the sun in the sky will be like this. You don't have to worry about that because the Earth will obviously no longer exist, will melt, Mercury will disappear, Venus, all the inner planets will disappear. And that will then be the end of the Earth. I think the Earth will come to its end much before that, for reasons that you and I are here. We will undoubtedly pollute the Earth to the point that it will not survive another five billion years. So. What remains now is this enormously big star where all the thermonuclear fusion has been used up. And since it is so big, the outer layers of the star, which we call the atmosphere of the star, is very loosely bound because it's so big. And most of it is expelled, is shedded, thrown off. And what remains now is the core which is that core of the last thermonuclear burning when carbon, carbon burned to oxygen. And that core, what remains, is what we call a white dwarf. That core typically has a mass roughly half the mass of the sun, sometimes one solar mass that depends on, on the star that you started with, but a typical core that remains is roughly half a solar mass to one solar mass, and it has the size of the Earth, small, 10,000 kilometers, typically. So, in an area, in a, in a volume as large as the Earth, you have an amount of matter 
that is comparable to the mass of our sun. How were they discovered? In 1838, the mathematician Bessel had studied the motion of Sirius A, Sirius is a very bright star in the sky, had studied the motion of Sirius and came to the conclusion that there had to be another star close to Sirius, which was invisible. And Bessel even predicted that the two stars, one invisible and one visible, were in a binary system going around each other, and he concluded from his calculations and his observations that the period going around each other was about 50 years, and that the mass of the invisible star was roughly the mass of the sun. And he wrote an extremely famous letter to Alexander von Humboldt, and I want to quote from that letter. It is, of course, translated in English. He wrote, I adhere to the conviction that the star Sirius is a binary system consisting of a visible and an invisible star. There is no reason to suppose that luminosity is an essential quality of cosmic bodies. Visibilities of countless stars is no argument against the invisibility of countless others. Now think about this for a minute. We tend not to believe what we can see. And here is a man who says, and I quote this last sentence, which is a fantastic sentence, visibilities of countless stars is no argument against the invisibility of countless others. So he was the person who said, look, what you cannot see doesn't mean it's not there. In 1862, a famous telescope builder, Clark, in my hometown, Cambridge, Massachusetts, built a new telescope, an 18 and a half refractor, and his son, Alvin Clark, aimed the telescope at Sirius when it was rising above the skyline in Boston. And what did he see? He did see a very bright star, which we now call Sirius A, and he saw an extremely faint star very close to Sirius A, which we now call Sirius B, which was the star that uh, Bessel had predicted. I will write down very few equations, but one is important. And that is how much energy per second can a star produce? Energy per second. This, we call that power in physics. And we give that a letter capital L which is luminosity. We use the word luminosity for power. Power. How many joules per second? Our sun is four times 10 to the 26 joules per second, in case you're interested. Now, it is immediately obvious to anyone, even if you have very little background in astronomy, that the larger the surface area is, the more heat can escape. So it is clearly obvious that this amount of energy per second must be proportional to its surface area itself. And the surface area of a sphere, for those of you who have taken nursery school, they know that it is 4 pi r square. So the luminosity must be proportional to the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r square. That is intuitive. Then there is a constant that you may forget. I call that constant sigma. It is a constant that you can look up in physics books. It's called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Forget that for now, it's not important. However, what comes now is not intuitive. Clearly, the hotter the star, the more energy will come out. So you expect that if the temperature is higher, that the luminosity is higher. 
That is true. But what is not so obvious, that it is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. So now we have series A and we have series B. And series A was 10,000 times fainter, uh, sorry, series B was 10,000 times fainter than series A. 